Hi, we are here for, for the Toro Law Review Podcast. Uh, my name is Michelle Zacharin. I am the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and I am joined today by Regina Birch, and she is the Interim Assistant Dean for Academic Excellence and Bar Success. She's also a visiting professor of law at Toro Law School. So what a great day to have have her here. We are going to be discussing the next gen bar exam. It's something that is being asked about and discussed on many listservs, um, on many websites, and just among a lot of the scholars and professionals in the area. So we are so fortunate to have one of one of these experts with us today, and she will answer some of our questions about this new bar exam, and we will get to hear some insight into the process of, of it. So thank you for being here today, Professor Birch. <laughs> it is totally my pleasure. And um, I'd like to say why it is that I would like to do this podcast. I attended a couple of sessions that were um, hosted by the National Conference of Bar Examiners, the, you know, the organization that produces the bar exam. And I had a lot of questions when I went into those sessions, a lot of questions that I'm sure are uh, the same questions that everyone has because the next gen bar exam is totally new. And I came away from those sessions with some answers that I wanted to share with you. So, um, so let me start off by saying again, thank you. And thank you to the law review for allowing me to, uh, to do this podcast. Um, I wanted to start by um, just talking a little bit in case you're not aware of why the NCBE decided to have a, a new bar exam. Is that a good place? Professor? That's wonderful, actually. So please let us know what you know about that. That would be great. Okay. Okay, so um, the current bar exam, as I'm sure you know, uh, is available in most jurisdictions. Uh, it's the Uniform Bar Exam, otherwise known as the UBE. And it's by now, I'm sure, urban legend, maybe not urban legend exactly, that the UBE just tests memorization and it doesn't really test the skills that newly licensed attor attorneys need to have. Now, I have been in, in law practice, I know you have, and we also, we know that clients don't expect newly licensed attorneys to have um, memorized the law and to uh, basically treat the client's problems as if it's a multiple choice question, right? So, uh, but that is what the uniform bar exam primarily tests. There's a whole day of multiple choice questions that um, test an individual's ability to memorize the law, spot narrow issues of law, and pick a correct answer out of four answer choices. So that's a full day of testing in most jurisdictions. In addition, there's a um, one day of the multi-state performance test, and uh, that's in the morning, and then in the afternoon, there are six multi-state multi essay exams, and those do test your ability to um, apply legal analysis skills, um, to uh, take a set of cases and statutes that you're given and interpret those, that the MPT does that. Um, the essay exam, on the other hand, it's you know still pretty much focused on memorization. So those exams do not test uh, what newly licensed attorneys are expected to do. And the bar examiners recognizing that decided to create a new exam that tests skills and abilities to use the law of the jurisdiction. It's more akin to what newly licensed attorneys are expected to do. Yeah, it, when you say it like that, it makes so much sense. And it almost makes you wonder, wow, what took so long? Why <laughs> why weren't we asked to ha to test our skills to be licensed attorneys before now? But um, I guess we all learned on the job or whatever we relied on. But this seems like a much more efficient and practical way to make sure that newly admitted attorneys are 
filled with the skills that they will need. So thank you for explaining that. So I guess that leads to the next, the next typical question that I would think comes to mind is, you know, what will this look like? Like, what, what do you expect? Or I guess, what do we know if we even know what are the plans for this next gen bar exam? Well, so we do know uh, subjects that will be tested and skills that will be tested. There will be eight subjects tested as opposed to the 14 that are currently tested. So the uh, you the uh, multiple choice subjects that are currently tested plus two. So in other words, and I'm going to make sure that I that I get them all in one fell swoop. Um, contracts constitutional law, criminal law, criminal procedure, um, evidence, real property, and torts. And the two new ones are business associations and professional responsibility. Now, you might think, what about family law? Family law is something that a lot of newly licensed attorneys do. Why is that not part of the list? And many practicing attorneys have asked that question. And so, NCBE has added family law back into the list of subjects that will be tested. Now, let me say just one thing about subjects that will be tested, that phrase subjects that will be tested. There still is some memorization required. And so there will be memorization required in those subject areas. But that's just, um, well, one out of three out of a total of three hours on the bar exam. There are um, three parts. There's um, the multiple choice part, which will look a lot like the current multiple choice exam, except instead of there being just four answer choices, there may be four to six answer choices. So that's different. There will be a, a performance test part that looks a little bit like the current NPT, but it's shorter. The third part is really the new part, and that's integrated question sets, integrated question sets. And those are um, a blend of multiple choice, short answer, and some of the um, legal reasoning and, and synthesis, research synthesis skills that are currently tested on the MPT. So this new type of exam question um, may have uh, some of the subjects that are tested in multiple choice, but it also can have other subject areas like family law. So family law will join the list of subjects to be tested in 2028, the list of foundational subjects in 2028. But between 2026, July 2026, and 2028, July 2026 being when the exam launches, and 2028, the examiners may include some family law questions in the integrated question set. So they don't expect you until 2028 to have memorized the doctrine in family law, but they still may test you on it. If they test you on it, they'll give it to you, just like they currently give law when they test in an MPT. Ah, uh, so they so that that's very interesting. There it's it's good to know because the students who will be taking the bar exam in 2026 and beyond are going to be subject to this so that leads me to it what's going is every state buying into this like what's ha do we know if it's definitely going to be administered in july of 2026 and do we know what what, what is what do you know about that so there are a few jurisdictions not new york and not florida um, that have signed up to administer the test in July of 2026, the earliest date that it will be available. And then there are um, at least six or seven others that have signed up for July of 2027. Uh, and the, um, the, the UBE, the current version of 
the Farzan will ex coexist with next gen for two years. So they're going to phase the current version out by 2028. And then we'll have to see what, what happens with the other jurisdictions. We're really waiting to hear. So, so there's a lot that's in, you know, up in the air. And um, but at least we know the subjects that will be tested. We know the skill areas that will be tested. Um, I should mention those that there are some specific skills that will be tested, and that's another way that the next gen is very different from the current. It's not going to be just issue spotting and legal analysis and application of the law. It's issue investigation, issue evaluation, client counseling and advising, negotiation and dispute resolution, client relationships and management, legal research, legal writing and drafting. So, um, so those skills will be tested on the exam. And so there's obviously less of an emphasis on memorization. Yeah, and I, I know I can speak for at Toro, since we're both at Toro, the legal, the current first year legal writing class covers a lot of those skills in it in its class currently. And so that's wonderful. And I'm sure many other schools also cover a lot of that in their legal writing programs. I guess there's going to be talk among many schools who are considering if, if it's going to be adopted in their jurisdiction to maybe expand on that into other years to continue with the focus on some of those skills as you know, you have the 1L focus, but then I guess they'll need the 2L focus and the 3L focus and, mm -hmm. and all of that. Right, that's right. And that's the NCBE's stated expectation that um, uh, schools will build on their currently existing clinical programs and legal writing programs in order to um, help students, help their students be prepared because um preparing for any bar exam starts when students come into law school even if they don't know it and so um right even if the the, the academic support department isn't emphasizing it or faculty aren't emphasizing it the types of exams that are administered the time conditions under which those exams are administered it all really um does align with how um, attorneys, how, how graduates are tested in order to become attorneys. That, it makes a lot of sense. You know, just hearing it stated like that, it makes a lot of sense. I think to most attorneys who, who are already practicing and or teaching or, you know, anything, it, it, it seems to be a good, it sounds like a great idea. Um, so I hope it's, I think it's being embraced, you know, in, in, a, in a positive way. It seems like it is. Um, because the format's going to be a little different from what we're used to, um, do you foresee any big changes in, I don't know, classroom preparation, um, you know, for the law school and for the law schools in general who are trying to prepare their students to pass this exam? Well, let's talk a little bit about the format because we yeah. didn't really get into it much. So the next gen exam will be shorter. It will be one and a half days instead of two days. <clears throat> and instead of having um, like a three hour chunk where the examinees will do performance tests and a three hours where they'll do multiple choice, they're actually going to do an hour of multiple choice and then an hour of the performance test and then an hour integrated question set. So that requires um, more flexibility in um, you know, and, and how you approach answering questions. So I would think that in, it, it really dovetails nicely with what we do at Toro, at least what I've seen happening now in, in classes. Professors uh, ask questions about the case facts, quickly move on to hypotheticals, and then um, talk about how uh, the uh, a certain how an attorney should advise a client or what additional information would an attorney need in order to be able to advise a client. So those are the kinds of skills that are um, that are emphasized in our classrooms as, as 
from my observation. I know those are the kinds of skills that are emphasized in the clinics as well. So I think that um, we, you know, we should continue to do that. We also um, have uh, relationships with several bar review companies and we're always on, and, and publishers. And so we're always on the lookout for um, materials that'll help us in the classroom. And the publishers and the bar review companies are working hard to prepare the materials for the next gen. So I think um, that there's there's really good partnerships here, right? There's the classroom, what happens in the classroom from the time uh, students enter law school and then uh, the, the big push right before they graduate to help them get a nice um, head start on bar prep. And then we'll of course continue to work with them in that eight to 10 week period during bar review. It, that's that's a, that sounds great. It, it it really should all work out. You know, hearing all of that, and of course, there's a lot to do for the prep companies to really prepare and, and figure this out. But um, mm -hmm. I I'm confident they they usually able to do just that, and so I'm confident they'll be able to do that for this bar exam as well. Um, do you do you have anything to speak about with the um, the fact that it's being developed, this next gen bar exam, like the evolution of it from the traditional bar exam, anything, any thoughts on that and anything you'd like to address? Well, I, I wanted to um, talk about the evolution of the format because I think that is really a big deal. Um, so, yeah. so there really still is a question of how do we teach students to exercise the kind of judgment that needs to be exercised when you're advising a client, right? How, how do we literally, like, what do we do in, in um, a law school setting? And how do we make sure that examinees can answer those questions correctly in the limited time period that they have? Because you don't really have a lot of time to think through a client problem. You don't as a newly licensed attorney either, but you have more than three hours, right? I mean, it's so, um, so that's, I think is, is, a, is going to be a challenge from the conversations that I've heard. Um, that's where most people are think, you know, the rubber hits the road. How are we actually going to do that? And things are evolving, right? There is no full next gen exam available. It is currently in field testing and it will be in field testing for some time, I think another year. Um, and in the meantime, there's no there's no full exam out there that we can use. To, to like kind of get our hands around and say, okay, we can make questions that are like this. We can work with people on, we can think about timing. We can think about how to get them to do these questions. Um, so I, I just heard today that the testing platform is changed. I think it was exemplified, but now it's um, a, a platform called Surpass. And Surpass is the same platform that the um, uh, medical licensing boards are um, used. So, right, so it really is in evolution and I really think we need to keep our eye on it and have another conversation as it's just a little bit further down the road. Yeah, no, absolutely. I Just that leads me to, um, you, you said there are no full exams out there yet. And I know because they're developing it and that makes sense, but I believe you had the um, unique experience of seeing um, a partial exam or some parts of the exam. So can you just speak a little bit about that since you actually were able to see some of it? Yes, yeah, so I um, was part of the pilot test and I recognized the formats of the integrated question sets on the pilot test. 
And so the, the pilot test included multiple choice questions with four to with uh, like five correct and five answer choices or six answer choices. And even though that sounds a little strange because we were taught when you're constructing a multiple choice question, make sure that there's only one answer choice. Uh, it, it seemed that it, the correct answer choices were really guided by the fact pattern and the call of the question. So it, was, it wasn't, you know, kind of a judgment call. It was really like statutory interpretation, let's say. Right, so it was it, it was okay. Um, it, the integrated question sets, though, they I thought uh, had more room for a, a, a greater interpretation of what is a correct response, what is an incorrect response. So, for example, uh, the exam might say th this question calls for a short answer. Um, more than one, a short answer uh, to describe a solution to, the, to this negotiation. More than one answer may be correct. Well, I mean, that's nice. <laughs> but how do you know that the one that you want to put down is the one that's the correct one? So, yeah, so I, uh -huh. I um, was surprised at this new question type. Um, and like I said, I think we're going to really need some guidance to answer those kinds of questions. And without seeing multiple of them, it, it'll be really hard to figure out how we, how, how a student can self-evaluate when they're, you know, we tell them take an exam and then do a self-assessment. Look at the, uh, see if you got the answer right or wrong in either case make sure that you look at the explanation. Be nice to um, be able to do that. Absolutely. I, I think, it's, yeah, it's it's going to take, I guess it's going to take time, more examples, more practice questions being, you know, provided to others and to really see how they grade it, what their plans are. Like you said, we will probably need more guidance for stuff like that, but at least you have the insight into the possibilities that are out there as to what some of this might look like. And so that's really useful. That's it's great. And so it, how wonderful that you got to experience that. Um, do you have advice for law students who may be taking the next gen bar exam? So um, that's a great question because these are um fairly new law students. So I would say, make sure that you're doing your, I mean, this is sort of the standard advice. You still need to do your briefing because you need to do that. That is a skill they will test on the exam and you don't wanna to have to learn it right before the exam. In, in fact, it's more significant on the next gen than on the current exam because they may give you a case excerpt and a statute excerpt in an integrated question set, as well as on a performance test, which is where you would usually see it. So make sure you do your briefing. Understand how uh, statutory sections and case briefs fit together. And then um, stay tuned. That's what I would say. Stay tuned. We are ex excited to find out what this looks like and as you are. And we can offer some practice questions now and kind of stay on the safe side, right? Since we don't know exactly. Um, but we will definitely um, do offer them as soon as we can get them. Yeah. Access, it, I was sorry. just going to say Access Lex and the NCBE are working together to produce sample questions that they can get out. So, so that is underway. Yeah. And case briefing has always been an important part of law school since, you know, forever probably. And so it makes sense that it's no different now. And especially, it sounds like what you're saying is they're going to give you excerpts from the cases and from statutes that 
they will be required to understand, like extract from what's extracted from pieces that are that they're given the important parts, what's relevant, what if there's a rule of law in there, all skills you develop from case briefing, even if in the beginning you feel like you're not getting it right, eventually you are being taught the more you do it, the more you are extracting the proper information and how useful that is um, when you go back to study and also just like in class and also just the skill of why you're reading the cases in the first place. So that's good to hear that 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 that's still required. That makes sense. And you need to do that when you're an attorney. You do. You so, do. You Most know. importantly, right. <laughs> once you get out of law school, you're going to be reading a lot of cases and statutes and, statutes, and interpreting yes. them. Right. And so them more than once. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So how do you have any suggestions for how law schools can stay updated with these changes? Yeah. So there are a number of conferences that law school faculty and academic support personnel can attend where NCBE speaks about exam development. There's a, a way to stay automatically updated by going to the NCBE website. You can sign up to get automatic updates about the next gen. Um, and then the NCBE staff are happy, they said, to come out to law schools and talk about exam development. So um, they are they are open and, and willing, and I think it makes sense to take advantage of all of those uh, all of those avenues of staying up to date. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you. And I guess I would ask, what kind of resources and support? What, what's available out there to help law students succeed because we want them to, we want them to do well past this next gen bar exam. Mm -hmm. um, right now it's kind of limited I mean, as far as what's out there on the internet, but we are at the law school, the academic excellence bar success department. We are, we are available. Um, we're available for day students evening students, Sunday flex students, and um, because now is the time to work on just the, the academic skills, right? And then that's uh, reading comprehension, um, ability to memorize the law. Like I said, it's still, you know, we're not off the hook for that. We still have to do that. Um, case briefing and outlining. Uh, those, if you have those skills down, that is even less that you have to do to be successful on the bar, because there's plenty to do once you get to the end of the law school journey, and you know you need to prepare yourself for the bar exam. Right. So, so bar prep starts day one, basically right. without even knowing it. Right. Day they don't even down. know. That's right. Um, but right, it's great that it's great that the resources, especially from a department just like like yours, um, is available to the students and um if they need help with any of these skills that they're struggling with, then of course they should seek, seek out some help early on instead of waiting. Um, and so I think that's great. And I, I even think it's great when the students who aren't struggling come in for a question because it, it'll give them the confidence to know they're not struggling, to know that they're getting it right. And they're, they're on track. I think it's, it's great for everyone. Right. So that's right. And I know that other law schools are, thinking along the same lines because the um, the call, the demand for academic support personnel and you know, staff and faculty has really um, increased tremendously over the last oh, yeah. 24 months or so. So I'm sure that, uh, and this is across the board. So where everyone is gearing up for, um, you know, for the next gen and for helping students who in whatever way were affected by COVID to kind of um, make sure that they're staying on track through law school. Wonderful. And this has been such a great summary and point, so many great points of information about the next gen bar exam. Do you have any concluding remarks maybe that you'd want to throw in um, just because this has been great, but maybe there's just anything in conclusion you'd want to add. 
Um, I actually can't think of um, much. I mean, I would I'd say that it it is a shift. The next gen is a significant shift in exam assessment. Um, but uh, we are we are ready. I think we will um, be um, right aligned with the uh, success in making that transition from the current bar exam to the next gen exam. How wonderful. Well, I thank you so much. I mean, Tor we could speak about Toro Law School for sure, and that we do always take pride in the fact that our students are practice ready when they graduate. And now with this new bar exam, um, it, it really will, it will even more so make sure, ensure that everyone is practice ready and ready to hit the ground running as soon as they graduate. So it sounds like, yeah, it's a shift and it will be a big deal to, you know, have this, but it's, sounds like it's for the good. It sounds like it's it's headed in a great direction ultimately for everyone. And so thank you for all of your expertise and all of the information you provided. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And thank you to the Toro Law Review for having us on today to discuss this very important topic. Until next time.